let's let's crack on if that's right. Jason Beckwood, welcome to the Manchester is Blue show. Thank you so much for spending the time and coming on to see us. I know your uh, your time's very valuable out in Canada, isn't it? What what time are you on over there, buddy? Uh, just gone three o'clock, so we were five hours behind here. So okay. yeah, so I, I always have to remind myself because when the games on at home, my mum was like, "Oh God, Jesus, forget <laughs> the the time difference." So I've always missed the kick off. Oh bless you! Well, me and you—I believe you're brought up in in Moss Side, Manchester. Is that is that is that was that home for you? Well, yeah. I mean, listen, people got to be you know got to be really you know careful about the Wikipedia stuff because it's not always the the truth. Oh, tell me more. Know, so, well, no, I'm I'm born I'm Longside. I'm born okay. Longside, so I'm, I'm down the road really, and obviously just a, you know a few miles away, um, in, in Longside there in Cliverall Road. That's where. Um, that's where I spent most of my life. We were born in Longsight. Uh, sorry, I was born in Longsight. And then um, we, we went to, we went and lived in Ancoats for 10 years. Yeah. When I was about, when I was uh, about five months old. And then we moved back to Longsight. And I said at Clitheroe Road and spent most of most of our time there. So when I was at City, uh, from uh, from about 10, from 10 years old, uh, um, I lived at uh, 25 Clitheroe Road, Longsight. So that was that was brilliant then for you to to, to see. Did you get, manage to get to many city games? Are you, I suppose the big question is: Did you always follow City, being from that type of area? Then was it was City Ooh. always the team you were? <laughs> That's a tough one. That Tom is a tough one, mate. Well, like you say, you know, you know, growing up in Manchester, you're either red or blue, aren't you? Indeed. You know, mm. And you know, a lot of my family are United fans. Um, well, we never really had a. I because we were into football pretty quick. You know, always like. You remember those days? I mean, it sounded like an old man. Those days, you could, you know, you could go to United one week, you could go to City the other week, yeah, couldn't yeah, you? Yeah, Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, I know a lot of um, fans that friends so, did that as well, yeah. So, yeah, so we, we you know, we not that we could afford to watch the games or anything, but when I was about 10, 11 years old, I was going watching City because um, I was kind of like, you know, because you couldn't really sign as a schoolboy until you were 14, but when I was 10 and playing for Manchester Boys with, <laughs> Um, you know, Andy Inchcliffe, me and Andy Inchcliffe, you know, we've known each other since we're, I was 10 and he was 11, he's a year older than me. So, playing for Manchester Boys together, like we, City were always um, had our eye on us, if, if that makes sense. So, I was always, um, yeah, I was always taken to games and stuff. The scout, a little fella called George Woodcock, used to take us to games and stuff like that. Or used to take me to games, pick me up, take me to games, take me to the Manchester Boys games and stuff. And, uh, you know, so I've always had a you know an affinity with City from always a young lad. So when you were, when you first played for the for the Manchester Boys, when did you first get sort of uh, taps up? How, how did that happen? How did you first know about City's interest in you? Um, I think um, I think uh, when well, my brother was there, my, my brother Darren was yeah, was at City um, at the time. Uh, I think he, he's you know, three years older than me, and. Um, that he came to the house to be quite honest. I think he came and actually, no, he came up to me dad after um, after a game after we played uh, for Manchester Boys under 11s. But uh, I was an under 10, so I was playing a year under age. Um, and he, the fella George Woodcock came up to me dad and said, you know, you know, well, you know, I like how he plays and stuff like that. And then he ended up coming to the house as well and asking me dad if he could come, you know, to the ground and. You know, jump in some um, training sessions every now and again. Right. So, and then, and then um, I suppose the rest is history. So, I love that. No, that's great. So, yeah. it's, it's interesting that you you played with um, Hinchcliffe as a as a junior, then and went on to play. Did you play many games with him alongside him at City? Yeah, First you know, we, we, yeah. So we played played alongside because obviously he was um, in in the team as well. But coming through the ranks, play from with him at the youth team, play with him at you know uh, in the reses and play with him in the first team as well. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny that you know, like I say, we've been known each other, and we play cricket together as well. Because you know, we both you know played a, a good standard cricket. He was a good cricketer as well, um, Andy, because he went to William Hume Grammar, and uh, we both played for Manchester Boys cricket as well. Oh, brilliant! So I don't know what it is with you footballers, but you're good at fucking everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah, to be honest, like it was uh, when I turned 14, I, I had to make a little bit of a choice because I was playing for Lancashire as well at cricket. So, um, me, um, I think, I think my mum, my, my mum was all right about it. My dad was a bit gutted, obviously being a Jamaican and you know lacking his his cricket in the West Indies. So. Um, when I said, okay, I'm just going to concentrate on my football, um, 
he, I mean, he was all right, obviously, but uh, he was a little, I think it was a tinge with a bit of disappointment that I, I chose football over cricket. Mm. Could have been one cricket star and one football star in, in the family then, couldn't they, I suppose? And then he could have uh, completed the set for him. <laughs> well, like I say, so, uh, I, to be honest, I kind of like looked at the, the kind of like the longevity of it. I'm thinking, you know what, I could probably get a bit more work in football. You know, <laughs> there was, there was a lot of money going around the cricket those days. You know what I mean? So I think I think they made the I think they made the wise choice, buddy. From from, yeah. from what you're saying. So you started off. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at a bit of information here. So you started off your your um, your debut for City proper in um, January, February, March, April '88. How, how long were you with City for before you made your debut? Um, I was at, well, as I say, I was there from 11, but I signed as a schoolboy at 14. Okay. Um, and then you, I signed as a, as an apprentice professional at 16, signed professional at 17. So, um, I actually was supposed to make my debut, uh, earlier on in the season, um, in 87 when I was, uh, uh 17, um, round about, I don't think it was probably around, uh, Round round the uh, probably around October November I was supposed to make my debut. I think um, I can't remember. I think I, can't, I think we might have been playing Oxford or something. And uh, I remember getting pulled in by um, Tony Book at the, at the time and Glyn Pardo, uh, gone rest his soul, um, and uh, saying, "Look, um, you're training with the first team today." So I'm like, I think it was 17 at the time. So I went. Okay, fine. So this was on the Monday, training with them on the Monday, training with them on the Tuesday. Uh, we had the game on the Wednesday and I'm saying, oh, right, right. So I remember going up with my mum and dad, looks like I'm making my debut with the first team tomorrow. Um, but we're coming in in the morning just to do a few, those days you come in and do a few, you know, set piece or whatever on the day of a game. Do you know what I mean? You don't really see that so much now. Um, and I remember going in and I remember going into training and like I was training with the youth team again. I'm like, going on here mm. <laughs> so, so don't even I didn't even get pulled or anything so anyway turns out um, I mean I, I had a great relationship with him you remember Paul Simpson don't you you know you know Simo and um, the manager at the time was Mel Machin as you probably know and uh, I think obviously Simo got wind of it you know obviously a young kid young, you know and I think it was me I think it might be my first year uh, my first year as a professional you know, it looks like I was going to come in and start the game, and um, you know, I think don't think Simo was too happy about it. And had a few words, and then the next minute I was I was sub for the game. Um, actually, no, I don't I don't even think I was even sub for the game. <laughs> so, yeah, I went from uh, actually you know starting, and then um, and then all of a sudden I wasn't involved. So then I, I had to wait later on in the season, as you know, right, kind of coming towards the end of the season in April before I made me my full debut what at Middlesbrough. Think? What do you think he? What do you think the issue was there that was similar? What, what do you think he said to Mel that, that put him off? Well, no. Well, listen. I think listen. I'm, I'm a, and it happens a lot. You know, back then, I mean, I was 17 years old, and Simo would have been, I don't know, mid 20, mid 20s, I would think. And uh, no, no, he's he, not. He would have been probably about 20. I think he's about five years old than me, Simo. And uh, you know, love Simo today. I used to do his boots, and. Um, I, you know, as you would do, you know, you think as a, as a professional, you think you're playing well or whatever, and then you stand your corner, don't you? And I think Mel, being Mel, like he wasn't the strongest in the world, you know what I mean, in terms yeah. of um, a, a manager. And we, we um, he, he did like the young players and he did like to bring them through. I think most of those lads, myself, Andy Inch, uh, Lakey, uh, I'm just trying. I think you know. I think probably a Whitey and Stevie Redmond probably made their debut with Billy McNeil. But I think uh, most of a lot of us made our um, deb debut yeah, with um, yeah, either Jim. Yeah, 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 Bob, Bob as well. So um, Paul Molden, you know, they probably probably made their debut with kind of round about the time with maybe um, Billy Matt. Um, Jimmy Frizzell and, uh, and Mel Machin so we all made our debuts if you like in between I would have thought within a year or two of each other I thought it was amazing making your first debut then how did it come across did you get the tap on the shoulder saying get your parents down to the ground or something like that? How, did it, how did it happen uh, just usual like you know I think you know 
by that time, you know, you're just thinking, okay, you just get pulled in the training and, you know, you're going to be playing. And, um, and by that time, I was training more often with the first team squad yeah. anyway. It was a bit obvious so, to you. Yeah, mm. well, it was, it was more of a kind of like a, 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 a natural progression, I should say. So I, I was training with them quite, quite a lot then anyway. So um, it was, like I say, it was just a natural progression and uh, just said we will play. And in fairness, you know, as you do, you know, because, you know, the one or two injuries. So, you know, again, uh, he's kind of next man up, isn't it? So I, I got my chance and, um, you know, stayed in the team to, you know, till the end of the season. Well, one thing I like to ask um, former players that come on and talk to us is, is when, when you were training with the first team, who, who were the players you were looking up to? Who were the, who were the real leaders in the team? You're thinking, oh, I can't wait to play with them. Or is it particularly yeah. the players that you looked up to thought, you know, this is, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I love Neil McNabb. I mean, Neil McNabb was a, you know, I know a lot of the lads probably in my generation would talk about Neil because he was always great with us young lads as well. You know, really good, good character. Um, I think Mick McCarthy, whose boots I used to do, um, I think Mick, Mick had probably just, he just left then, to be, to be honest. Um, I think he got to Celtic then because Billy Matt went up, went up there. Um, I'm just trying to think who, who else at, at that time. Um, I mean, to be honest, it was, it, he, he was one of the more experienced players, but if, if anybody that was what supported City around that time, we were, we were a very young side. So mm. a lot of the lads we'd all play together in the youth team or the reserves at, at one at one stage or another. So you basically play play with your mates <laughs> again that you you played with as a, as kids. You know what I mean? So we had um, we had Gordon Davies on uh, Jason, yeah. Yeah. and uh, he said that he said uh, that the young lads sort of pushed all the senior pros out of the squad really because. Like yeah. Gordon was telling me, he never even mm. wanted to leave City. That he just yeah. got forced to get sold. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Gordon, a nice fella, nice fella. Again, nice I guy. think uh, you know, and I, I again, he was one of those that, um, you know, I think the, the club made a decision that you know what we're gonna we're gonna get behind these youngins. I think we've got yeah. you know got a few coming through, and and as well, it, financially, we're probably a bit cheaper as well. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. Um, it's, you know, sometimes economics, you know, um, kind of, uh, you know, well, kind of, kind of makes way, doesn't it? And so the likes of Gordon and I was supposed to um, just try to think of his, you know, Jim told me we would probably been around when he was there as well. Yeah. And um, probably maybe got moved on. Yeah. Right. So you, you, you were coming towards the end of the, um, looking at the, the, the 1990, 91 season and, and Peter Reid was, was managing it at that time. Did you play with Peter? Yeah, like I say, I played with Peter, and like I say, I uh, played a few a few games with him, and uh, I always got a well with Peter. I mean, you always look back at your career sometimes. I look at me, you know, my you know, my City career where you know, I, I know I probably should have played more, um, and I think sometimes that's always down to um, managers in terms of whether they fancy the way that you play or not, and that and that's and that's fine, and that's just life, isn't it? But um, yeah. I think when um, I always call it when the when the ex Everton connection came, um, it was really good for us young lads because all of a sudden now we had, you know, people that had been there and done it, and mm. actually brought up a level of professionalism within the club, not only um, in training but obviously in the games as well. So I kind of, if you remember that 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 year where they came and um, the likes of Peter and. Uh, Alan Harper, Wayne Clark, uh, Neil Poynton, um, Mark Ward, you know, a few of those lads, they all came and uh, they, they gave us a lift and they, you know, they were great. So at the end of that, so that was that season, I think it would have been 89-90 uh, season, I think with the night, the season we beat, beat City 5, oh, sorry, beat United 5-1. Um, mm -hmm. I think Howard came. Um, and then obviously the, the 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 Everton connection came in there, but um, but as I said, I think my career would have been probably a lot different at City if Howard had stayed that Still that year. I'm sure he regrets leaving, you know. I'm sure he must. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, Inchi. I mean, again, sorry, Agent Eat was another lad who. I mean, I love Inchi to death. Like you know, he was he was he was such a funny character. I just I used to change next to him, and he just he'd do stupid stuff like. 
you know, he, he dropped it. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a man queuing from Longside. We don't, we don't do credit cards or anything like that, do we? You know, he, <laughs> he, he dropped it. He dropped his gold credit card on me towel, like you know, just after training or something. Like, oh, is that mine? All right, okay, and I'm just, <laughs> just pick it up. You know, he's that kind of lad. He, he was funny. Um, he, he, he had some good stories, but um, again, he was one of those where. You know, love playing with him and just the, the aura they had around the training rooms. And he always says, "In she, I would regret it. He did regret going back to Everton when he did because we kind of like just about to get something going. I reckon, mm. you know, with, with him there, and he was kind of grooming me at the time where, you know, he turned down two hundred fifty grand for me at, from Blackburn. He turned down two hundred fifty grand for me at uh, Derby, and um, I'm kind of thinking at that time. As you know, I was probably in and out the side, all, you know, all the time. And uh, I was, as I say, 20 then or 21. You know, I, I need to be playing regular football somewhere. So I kind of was like, well, let let me go. Um, but he says, no, no, I, 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 I've, you know, it's, I've just got it right here for you. Because he, he just was saying that I'd go and probably take Inchi's place. Because obviously Inchi was coming towards the end of his, you know, uh, he was in the twilight of his career, if you like. So... He said that's what he was grooming me for, and I went, okay, fair enough. And because that was his, that was one of the things that people don't realize about Howard was he was a great man manager. You know, he was very, very good in terms of managing the lads and managing different um, uh, personalities and stuff like that. So he, he was did like a drink, by the way, um, <laughs> but um, he, he did uh, he did manage people pretty well. So so when he did go to um, to uh, to back to Everton, uh, I wasn't sure what it was going to be like for me, and and we we really coming into in, being the manager then, and he brought in um, some fella called Sam Ellis as well, who um, I'll let the rest of the lads talk to you about him, but um, hmm. yeah, it wasn't the, he wasn't the most favourite coach in the world, but um, it was difficult for really because listen, I mean, really gone from like being in the dressing room with us as a player, and all of a sudden he's the manager now. So, yeah. you know, it, it was difficult for him, I think, you know, obviously making that transition of being a teammate and then being the manager as well, or, or trying to play both, obviously, at the time, because he was playing manager. So, with, with what were you like in the dressing room? Yeah, good question. Sorry? What was he like in the dressing room as a really? player? Yeah, could he cross yeah. clown? I can imagine he liked to booze. Oh, yeah. I think uh, mean, Colin Hendry actually put him in his top five drinkers, didn't he, Tom? He did. He did. There's a few there. <laughs> Hundred percent. I mean, he's a, he's a Guinness fella. He's a Guinness man. They, they all that crew there. I mean, as I say, him, Inchy, uh, Wayne Clark, as I say, um, uh, Alan Harper, all boozers. So they 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 brought the Wednesday club to us. You know, yeah. we 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 were never. You uh, can imagine that we were all like. We're, we're all getting a, like an education. So I was probably the young. Well, I was. I was the youngest in that kind of group there so myself and then you've got above uh, Oldman Meese and then you've got Paul Lake um, he was my best mate so we st we obviously still always in contact now so me Paul then you got Andy Inch then you'd have Ian Ian Bright so you got Bob Brightwell uh, David White and then you got Stevie Redmond so then and then uh, I think Moldy had gone by then so there's six of us then really so that were young the young lads that have come come through as it were and uh, then you got all these Everton lads, and <laughs> they were great lads, honestly, great lads. But the just the ale that was drank was just <laughs> unreal. We'd never known anything <laughs> like it. It was just, and he, he started to try and hide, you know, like because he, he, he didn't want to get on that. Oh, sorry, a big Quinny was about a big Quinny was about then as well. So the big man was brilliant. The, the big and the big man could drink. He's in my top five, no doubt. The big man, the big man would make you laugh though because he he would be like, you know, he'd have a he'd have a pint there and you'd think he'd got a full pint and you go, yeah, yeah, and you just you know, and the next minute you turn around, there's like there's no left in his pint, you know, and you're thinking, oh, where's that gone? It's just like honestly, and he and he'd never change, his expression would never change. He'd he'd have he'd have fifteen in the night and he'd just he'd just be he'd been out to him. But I suppose <laughs> I don't want to be stereotypical. Like they're probably in his jeans, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no. How long? I want him to wear his disco pants out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Quinny. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, he was top top lad, top top lad. Him. Have you got any stories about nights out you can tell us that are uh, semi PG? Oh, okay. maybe, yeah, maybe fifteen. Right, I can't. I can't be telling no semi wives down here. <laughs> ask, asking for stories about when we were out. Is that right, Colette? Um, <laughs> No, <laughs> no I mean, just like I tell you, I, I, I mean, I, and this is the difference really in in terms of um, the the game and the way it is now. Because if we're honest, and like you say, there was there was more. I would say there was more drinking back in the eighties and the nineties when you when we were playing. Um, I'm not saying I was a big drinker. I, I, I wasn't, but there was more um, alcohol involved. So it was yeah. kind of it was kind of expected, you know, like. You know, when you from Thursday onwards, the where you wasn't allowed on licensed premises. Um, after the game on a Saturday, you know, you'd be out on a Saturday night. Uh, you, you'd be out on an all day or on Sunday. You know, um, and then Monday, you know, obviously, you know, you're training on Monday. Uh, we used to have a Wednesday club where all the lads we had to have a ch- we were having a Chinese and you know like a team thing. So that was every Wednesday. So where, where would you meet for that? Where would, where would that be? Being ta- well, we'd be go from the ground and we'd go into town. So we'd be, in, we'd be anywhere in town, anywhere in ta- Chinatown. So, I mean, we call it, you know, like you say, it was a Wednesday. So it could be anywhere or we, we, we might even go into into Hale or um, up into, you know, the airport there, Mulligans. Don't you remember Mulligans? Mulligans, uh, near Mulligan. the airport. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a while ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we'd be, we'd be up there, so, uh, and you get into it, so... I, I remember, it, it, in fact, it was Dial Quinn and, and, and AJ and E. So it was like after after training, I think it would have been a, it'd been a Tuesday. And like, uh, Quinny goes, Do you fancy a pint? Do you fancy, fancy a pint, young And I'm like, When I said, It's one o'clock with Quinny. You know, I'm going I'm <laughs> home. I mean, I'm still living at home with my mum at the time. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, I'm 19. So it's like, um, Cutting, nah, I'm saying, nah, I'm all right, Quinny. Like, no, 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 me and she are going like, come on, come on. So, all right, fine. So, this is about one o'clock. Wasn't much persuasion there, was the Jason? <laughs> <laughs> no, all right, fair <laughs> I'm trying to paint a different picture of yourself here, aren't I? Yeah, all right. Um, so, I, <laughs> so, I says to him, I says, all right, come on then. So, it's about, like, say, half one. Before you turn around, it's like half four. We're in, we're in town somewhere. And Inchy's driving. <laughs> so it's like, okay, so I said, all right, well, so now we're at it now, aren't we? So I said, okay, so where are we off now? So said, oh, we'll get to Mulligan's for a bit. So we go to the airport, you know, because it's near the airport, wasn't it? So I said, okay, we'll get up there. Inches drives up, up there. We get up there. We're on the ale there. Now, at the time, Inchy had a place, didn't he? He had a place, I think it's called Heroes uh, um, in Stoke, in Stoke on Trent. Um, he had a place up there. So, um, it was about nine o'clock now. Come on, we go to Stoke. We're going because he still lived in Stoke. Come on, we go to Stoke. So you can imagine we've been on the LCS one, <laughs> and again, I, and I would never advocate this for anybody, but again, as you do at the time, that's that culture. You know, we're in a car now with Inchy driving on the M6 going to going to Stoke, and when I think back, I'm thinking, what the what are you doing? What are you do anyway? And I swear to God, we're going down the M6 and everything. He hits the central reservation. He's got a black murky. He hits the central reservation, right? And me and Quinn are going, oh my God, we're going to die. You know, so we lost it. He ends up getting off. We get off to his, we end up eventually, God, oh, thank God we got, get to his house. He goes to park the car in the garage, hits the garage wraps his car against the garage can't, he can't even put the car in the garage and then we're out now in Stoke <laughs> out, out, so it's the only time I've ever been late for training ever been late for training because the next day and the good job was with them too because like you know obviously them two they're, they're kind of like the blue eyed boys of, of, of Howard next day gets to training Inchy is driving now in, in his battered he's bat, beat up now his car his, his black bird Gets us back for training. We all walk in as you would. Hey, hey, hey. training started. <laughs> well, it's like where you know where have you lot been? And oh yeah, yeah. That's it. And, and then and then the lads are looking. So Reed looks at me. And says, "Don't get involved with them two bags. Don't get involved <laughs> with them two." Schoolboy error that. I said, "Yeah, don't, don't worry. I won't be doing it again." But um, 
but again, it's it's, sto- it's stories like that where you, obviously you look back and just think there, but for the grace of God. But these days, I mean, could you imagine these days? Oh, it, it just, well. you couldn't even breathe. You can't. You couldn't. You can't breathe now, can you? As an ex-player, oh, sorry, as a player. But back then. I mean, the press would have had a field day if they knew half of the stuff that was going on. I mean, yeah, that's done these days. You never let it down. And it's with you for the rest of your career. So it's, oh, yeah. it's different, different gravy into then. Crikey. Well, no, yeah. I mean, it's more of. I mean, in fairness to him, and, and, and rightly so, it's more of a lifestyle now. You know, I think mm. you know they look after themselves. I'm like, you know, the science is there as well, into about how people got to look after themselves and stuff and sleep and they got. They've got everything going for them now, footballers, in terms of helping them to make sure everything is right for them off the field for, to enable them to go and perform on the field. So, you know what? Good good for them. Oh, mm. Brilliant. I love that. Oh, crikey. You know, do you ever, do you ever think to yourself, I could, I, could write, I could write a little book about all the stories you have in everyone? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, hey, you lose them, a lot of yeah. friends very quickly. Oh yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> all my, I'll, I'll tell you what. A lot of my stories. I mean, they, they, they're always around the goalkeepers. Well, Andy Dibble. I mean, anybody who ended up playing with Andy Dibble would have loads of stories about Andy Dibble, um, because Dibs being Dibs, you know, great lad, all the rest of it. He won't mind me saying, you know, he, you know, wasn't always the brightest in the world. You know, in terms of some decisions that I'd make. I mean, this time of year always makes me laugh when it's pre-season. Oh, well, it would have been pre-season, wouldn't it? Um, well, yeah, it's still pre-season. You know, you'd after you know after training, you'd find dibs in his car, and he'd, he'd got a towel around him or something like that, and he'd come from training like, what, what, what's Dibble doing in his car? And then he like you'd open the car door like, and it's absolutely roasted in the car door, you know, in the car. And I mean, what are you doing? He's all oh, trying to lose a few pounds, like, you know. <laughs> what, what are you doing? He just, it, it just does those outlandish stuff that none of you, none of us would even think about doing. You know, r- running around, say, running around, say, a water park. And yeah. he, he's thinking, do you know what? It looks like a shorter route that if I swim across the, the actual lake. So... <laughs> So we go, we go on a run. We've been on the run and everything. Like we finished this run and it's been half half an hour's gone. I mean, yeah, but where's Dibble? Where's Dibble? Anyway, <laughs> comes comes back absolutely drenched, you know, with all this gear and everything. And he's like, "Oh no, I just I just thought I I, I just I couldn't do any more, lads. So I thought I'll just swim across that, and it do, it, do, it looked pretty short, but but yeah, it's far, isn't it? We just. <laughs> He's the funniest man. Oh, God. He's oh, thinking that in between deckers, isn't he? He what, sorry? Go on, Dan, what are you saying? I'd say none of keepers are wired up, right, though, are they? Well, yeah, yeah. Cause you'd have to be, wouldn't you? You know, just playing in, <laughs> playing in that, that and, you know, Tony Colton, he, he's a good character as well. Funny, funny guy, but tough guy, him. Proper solid. Yeah, I had a lot of love for him. Probably recognise that that goalkeeper top I got from Winter yeah. Colton, one of my favourite players. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's solid. Him, he just him and the, he come at that school of um, Mick Harford. You know, the centre forward that used to be at Birmingham. He played him at Birmingham. And ironically, I played for Birmingham as well. But um, yeah, he was he was solid, totally. So when you when you moved on from City, mm. we'll try we'll try and bring that away from the uh, away from the drunk driving and the uh, <laughs> in, in a sauna Please. suit. Sorry, but, uh, no, I love it. I, I love I love stories like this. It's fantastic. So you, you moved on from City, and did you did you? Because obviously, I'm just trying to think now. Because when, when, when obviously Peter Reed was your mate as a manager yeah. at the same time, mm. so you weren't playing as much. Did he did he no. kind of have that conversation with him to say, listen, I need to be playing more? And it was kind of like, yeah, I understand. You can go to, was it Blackburn? Yeah, well, yeah. I, well, at the time, I'd actually been on loan to Port Vale. And then um, okay. I went on it. I've been on loan, sorry, I've been on loan to Blackburn, came back and then went on loan to Port Vale. And, and they'd, they'd agreed a fee beforehand, but I think, I don't think Port Vale could have, you know, could afford the fee. And um, I was kind of like, as you say, I, I wanted to get away. Just really wanted to get away then. I was 21. I needed to be playing. And just came in, um, as you do one day after training, and the Reedy Pill brought me in and just said, look, son, um, Birmingham have come in for you. And, um, you know, we've, we've agreed a fee. So I went, OK, right, fine. But the, the thing that I remember about it so much, I remember was because, like I say, I always got on with Reedy. Me and him always had a good relationship, always. And um, 
he said, you know, it's an opportunity for you to go and play and, you know, get your career going. I said, all right, thanks very much. And I remember that uh, the fella next, sat next to him, um, Sam Ellis, who uh, not my favourite person. And I know a lot of the lads didn't, weren't keen on him either. And I remember saying, um, and don't think, you, don't think you're getting there, going there to earn a few quid either. You're just going there to fucking play. And I remember looking at him thinking, I mean, this is fella, like, no disrespect, but, you know, Berry and Black, Blackpool and stuff, you know what I mean? Just lower league, like, clubs and everything. He's, he, you know, he's not, no one's going to look at him and say, oh, yeah, he's a fantastic coach and all the rest of it. So, yeah. and um, it, we, we all, anyway, he wasn't, we weren't keen on him anyway. And Reed even says, you know, to this day, like, I remember speaking to him later on afterwards saying, you know what, um, you know, maybe that kind of thing, maybe that might have been a mistake that he made bringing him in at the time. Do you know what I mean? He made better off maybe bringing a different character, but I think really knew him well. He's a, a mate of his and stuff. And that's what football is. He's it it very matey, isn't it? You know, oh yeah, I know him and whatever. And... Well, Mark Hughes did that, didn't he? Mark Hughes, when he came to City as a manager, he just brought mm. all his mates in, didn't he? Mm. And, uh, <laughs> I actually said that exact, uh, on a different podcast, didn't we? That we said that, like, Mark Hughes has bring, brought these players that have played in League One, and they're going to be telling Robinho I have to step over the box and that. Do you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah, well, like, you know, as I say, I think, you know, managers, Dan, they, they kind of stick to what they know, don't they? And particularly mm. when it comes to their staff, you know, backroom staff, you know, they want to yeah. bring in people that they know and that they trust. Because uh, that's where, it, you know, because... You know, football's a little bit like that. You want they want to have people around, and it's that I've got their back, and they can they'll back them up. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, maybe really brought that type of person in. You know, at that time. But anyway, I went to Birmingham, and as I just say, um, I think it was 90, 1990, 1990, January ninety two. I think went to uh, uh, sorry, uh, Birmingham, signed for Birmingham. So what was the Wednesday night club like then, when everyone knew you were leaving, or did, or did you just kind of disappear into the midnight? <laughs> I did, to, to be quite honest. It was, um, I mean, it was one of them. I always think it's a shame was, that when players do that. There's a, it's very much like go and get your trainers when everyone, no one's there type thing. I don't, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, listen, I said big goodbyes, obviously, at training and everything, but, um, you know, obviously there's, there's lads that you've been with since you were, you know, 12, you know, 13, and, you know, I've been with those lads, like you say, you know, Lakey, Binchy. Oh, Inchi had gone to Everton by then, um, I think. But, um, you know, Lakey, uh, Whitey, Brighty, um, you know, Steve Redmond, all those lads, we, you know, been together from, you know, from, from was a, a kid. So, that, you know, that part of it, yeah, it was, it was sad. But, you know what, you're going to go to play. I was excited about going up somewhere I was, where I was going to play. And I was going to play every week. Yeah, no, I can get that. It must have been an exciting challenge for you then. Did, did you move down there then? I'm assuming you did. Yeah, well, <laughs> funnily enough, I end up playing with an old ex-City teammate, Nigel Glegg, on there. Oh, right, OK, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Nigel was there and um, we, we, he was still living in Manchester and he was travelling every day. You know, Nigel being Nigel, I'm, I'm like, OK. So I, I was travelling every day and it got to February. I'm like, are you kidding me? You keep travelling, you know, driving my way to Birmingham. And like, you know, it, it was one of those where, as you know, the M6 isn't the best motorway in the world, is it? So you'd have to, you'd have to time it, wouldn't you? So, but five minutes after, you know, like you, you've got to be on that M6 at seven o'clock. Yeah, yeah. If you're on it at five past six, it's five past seven, you know, you get to Hilton Park there and it's just us, you know, it's like a gridlock. So then it's like, okay, we're going to be late for training here. So, so I ended up moving, I ended up buying a house there in Birmingham around that February, March time. Um, yeah, so I, I ended up buying a house down there because I was fed up with the travelling after a month or so, and um, Nigel was still doing the travelling. In fairness to Nigel, in fairness to Nigel, though, you know he he had a family. He's got a family then, hasn't he? I mean, he's older than me, and he's got kids and stuff. And I, I think they may have been in school, so you didn't want to uproot the kids, did it? So. Everyone's got their own. Everyone's got their own scenario, haven't they? With why yeah, they did so, yeah, of course. course. No, I get that. So you 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 moved on um, after after your football career, and you moved into into coaching, and I believe you're running your own business now, looking at looking at how you how you're doing things. Is that right? How, how, how you, I suppose what what I want to get to is, did you did you know you always wanted to move into coaching, playing through football, or is it something that you just like, kind of think I need to do something else? Yeah, pretty much. You know, just the. Um, 
Yeah, no, I didn't think I was going to get into coaching. Well, I didn't think I was going to go into coaching as early as I did. Um, and I wasn't even thinking of coaching. I was just, I, I, when I went to Birmingham, I got a, I got a bad injury uh, at Birmingham and it, it kind of, you know, I've, I've had, you know, operations and sub subsequent operations. So I had to, I had to pack in, pack in playing from when I was 26. I mean, I was finished really at 22 at Birmingham. But then I had, as you know, I had a couple of spells then at, you know, Stoke and Millwall. And I was just, I was nowhere near the same. So um, I basically, I was 26 and like, okay, you know, no, no real formal education as such. Um, Cause you just go straight from school, don't you? And play football. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I basically went back to city. I went back to city and uh, I was doing uh, work, working in football in the community. So I was going into schools um, doing my coaching and I ended up doing my coaching badges going through that, going through City. So when the the um, uh, the, the academy started, you know, we the, the first, I think it was 97, you know, I was, I, I was coaching, I think I was coaching the U, U10s or the U11s, you know, so um, I started my coaching career there so, and, you know, n never really looked back, just, you know, loved it. Well, I suppose it's keeping the drip like, like just leaving the dressing room in it. I bet you that's a hard thing to move on from, and you've got perfect job to still be with banter and, like you say, about passing it on to young kids or anybody rewarding. Yeah, I think I think Dan, to, to your point, it was trying to look for something that you you, you know you all of a sudden <laughs> always say to people you know about football, and I think that's what sometimes you know when people get into this mental health issue and stuff like that is that. Um, when you're in football, you know, you, your phone's always buzzing. There's always one of the lads on the phone, what are you doing? Are you going on? What's doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then it's funny that as soon as, that, as soon as you finish football, that phone starts ringing. Mm. And people don't understand that. I mean, because for a lot of football people, I, I've even talked about mentioning there, their acquaintances are not really friends as such. Their acquaintances, you know, you, you have a, there's a period of your life where you go through and you, you're quite tight with them for a bit. And then obviously, then you move on. I mean, the only one I'm still very tight with, well, since we, again, since we were very young, was is Paul Lake. So that in itself, so you have to do something. In, in it, so instead of wallowing in it, I, I was like, okay, I'm 26 finished, I want to go and coach. So uh, that was the closest thing to football that I, that I knew. That was one thing I knew. So uh, I, I got into that and, I was, you know, turns out you, you end up thinking about, don't realise, and you probably had some skills that you didn't realise you had. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I wasn't bad at it. And uh, but what happened for me was I ended up coaching in the academy. So I was at Man City for, I think I coached there for five years. Um, and then just just to what um was I had a bit of a had a bit of a fallout if I'm honest with uh, with one of the coaches uh, the, the the head coach at the time a fella called Alex Gibson I think his name was um like you know a, a bit of a name dropper I don't and I don't like that you know I'm a you know I'm a straightforward man like you don't name you don't name drop I mean we can all name drop but this fella never even played football, but once the name dropped, you know, oh yeah, when when Scolesy when Scolesy was with me at England Youth and all that type of thing, and I'd be like, mm. you know, yeah, I played against him, mate, but I'm not going on like going, oh yeah, I played against Paul Scholes. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I just think he just calmed out. So again, I, I wasn't I wasn't a fan of him. So I ended up going to Bolton then and um uh coaching at Bolton um in their their academy. But at that time, then I'd have been in my early thirties, so I was probably about thirty-one, um, 30, yeah, thirty-one, thirty-two, and then I th sorry, yeah, I was thirty, thirty-one, and then I thought, you know what, I, it's one thing coaching to develop players, but there's nothing like being in a dressing where you've got to win games of football. You know, mm. you want to you want to get three points, and there's that buzz around it. So you probably see that I end up going coaching at uh, Mosley. I mean, I'm coaching at Mosley for. Uh, and being the head coach there for about five years where, you know, we were pretty successful, you know, like uh, we got a couple of promotions in a couple of years, uh, won a couple of, you know, League Cups. So we we're quite um, successful. But again, lads, when you do get promoted going through the levels, um, you need some, uh, so we say, so, you know, some investment, if you like, to actually stay up there or keep going. 
but you know at the time they didn't really didn't really do that so I kind of like when you know what well we got I think we got relegated from the the, the Unibon Prem so it's the the you know conference no it's a one below conference now so Unibon Premier it's not the Premier League and I kind of like when you know I'm not having that so I kind of like went out now really you know in hindsight maybe I should have gone to another club and got you know maybe start coach there but no disrespect at the time the semi pro thing he was doing me heading because they were not serious you know some of them yeah. just like it's a bit of beer money in it for some of them and, and uh, I, I wanted something a bit more serious than that so so that's when um, I, I started to do some coach was coach education for the FA so um, I started to do some some coach some coach um, education for them. Uh, working with again, working with Nigel Gleggon. So Nigel, Nigel was doing coach education there. Another ex City player, Ian Scott. So Scotty was doing a bit then for the FA. So that now been about, uh, I'd have been about in my mid thirties then, um, and then went and started to do stuff into um, in a, a higher education college. So I started to teach at higher education again with Nigel. <laughs> um, and we were, both was working at Trafford College, you know, and we were running the, remember the MVQs, the National Vocation yeah, yeah, Qualification. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we were doing the one round uh, coaching, teaching, instructing, instructing. So we did that. Uh, so I was doing that. And then all of a sudden, my missus was saying, well, not all of a sudden, we, we've been to Canada a couple of times. She's got family over here and stuff. And she said, you know, I wouldn't mind fancy having a, you know, Try and living out there and stuff like that, and I, I kind of thought, mm, not sure, you know, my parents were here and stuff like that. But but then we just said, you know what, you know, we could always come back. You know, where the kids were, you know, my son was thirteen, just thirteen. My daughter was, you know, nine, going ten. So if we don't like it, we come back. And well, as I say, eight years later, we're still here. Jason, I've got loads of questions to ask you there. Please. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I, 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 one of them I want to talk to you about. You finishing your career, but I think we'll just mm. go go back to that and we'll we'll sum that up at end. But mm. obviously, you came through YTS and that at City, and uh, then you've done the coaching kids you said. Now, did, did you see the change from being like or oh, clipping round ear old to being <laughs> like like no, you're all winners here, lads. <laughs> you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, we, we. I mean, listen, it's like anything. You want to balance, don't you? And mm -hmm. uh, I think we, you know, we are, we are in the kind of that participation era, aren't we? Where everyone's it's about participation, but understanding that, you know, when you're in a professional environment, you're in a professional environment to win games of football, and yeah. there's a certain there's a certain things that I have to, I may say to you, as a as a coach that you might not like at the time, but you know what, I'm doing that to try and get a rise out of here and, and try to get us, to, you know, there's a means to an end. Now, mm. I'm saying that about professional football. When you talk about children and young people, that is, they're exactly what they are, Dan, they're children and young people. So you have to yeah, make yeah. sure that you, 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 you cater your language to, to that kind of, um, to, to those kids and that your language has to be appropriate at that time. So, I always say that I mean you, some of the stuff that got said to us, like when when um you know when we were you know thirteen, fourteen coming through at Man City. I mean, you probably make people's it uh, toes curl. But I, 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 and what happened as well was some of us actually came through it, Dan. It was kind of like a survival of the fittest. So you got yeah. hammered, you got hammered, and some of us could go go all right. I can show you, and then others were like. And they just roll into a ball, so you, you have to be you have to be careful about how you treat young people. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't be demanding still. And like I say, particularly when you're in a professional environment, people got to understand it's different when you you know you, you volunteer coach at within Denton Youth or whatever it is or Ermston Meadowside. Um, it's it's participation football, but when you get in a professional environment where your job is to develop players for the next age group or for the you know for the next you know few years or whatever, it gets more serious. 
So, you yeah. know, I have to be demanding in what I say, but I always say it's not what you say sometimes, but a lot of the time it's how you say it. Yeah. So, uh, coaches are, 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 um, are, very na- are, not, are now very wary about how they speak to players um, because, um, you know, there is, you know, there, there is um, litigation out there, isn't there, in terms of bullying and what kind, all that kind of stuff. And I agree with it totally. Because they, mm. they were bullies when we were, you know, when we were when we were playing, they were. But I'm say, I always say, there's a there's a time for all that. There's a time for that when you like, you know, when you, you know, when you're a professional and it, it matters about winning games and things are going to get said, and yeah. then you know, and whatever it gets said, it, it's it's gets said in the in the change room and it stays in the four walls. But you know what? I'm saying stuff to you that you know you, that we've got to we've got to get going, but. Again, it, it has to be appropriate for the for the context or for the for the environment that you try that you're coaching within, and the, when you and the age group as well, really yeah. important. So, I mean, it makes you makes you think, like you say, how many good players must be out there that just crumble across a bully oh. from your era? It must be mad when you think about it. Loads, loads. I mean, the lads could tell you stories. I mean, I, I'll give you the quick story here about um, Chris Coleman. And now Chris Coleman, uh, um, you know, managed managed uh, Wales, um, and had a you know good football career. As well. I don't know if you remember Chris Coleman, but I don't think many people remember him. Chris was an apprentice at Man City. Um, Chris comes from a small. He comes from a small um, place in South Wales. Lovely lad, but Chris was like six foot three, six foot four at fifteen, and and built like a man. So. You know, at that age, um, you know, he was expected to do certain things. So when we when we started as profession as apprentice professionals, I remember it from day one. He was actually just hammered every day. Look at the size of you. You should be doing this. You should have, look at the, look at that. Look at your your big tat. It was relentless. And uh, when you know, when I think back, and then. We play. <laughs> I always remember because it was it was like the first week. It was the first week of games that we had, and our first game was uh, Man United in the in the Man United in the eighteen. So it was um, Saturday we played Man United. Tuesday we played Leeds United in the Reses. Saturday we, we we played Liverpool in the in the eighteen again. And Chris played. We played against Man United, and Chris had a quiet game, should we say? And, um, you know, our, our, our coaches at the time hammered him. And I remember Chris saying after the game, saying, that's it, I've had enough. I've had enough. Mm. And he went back to Wales after the game and never came back. Now, literally never came back. Uh, now, fair play to him. He, he, he got his career going again at, at, at Swansea. So played at Swansea. And I think he went and played... Played at Fulham, did well at Fulham, played at Blackburn as well, and obviously, you know, he had a good, decent career, didn't he? And um, obviously, manager of Wales and other other, other places. So he ended up turning it around. But not every story is like Chris Coleman. Do you know what I mean? No, that, I'm just going to say though, really, you think how lucky you are to get a call up from Swansea because really, Swansea might have just not not known about him. He might have never played football again. <laughs> Hundred percent. I mean, he's obviously a local lad. I mean, that would have been a big thing even then. You know, like you know, a lad going to going to Manchester City from from Wales. Mm. Um, you know, you're a small Welsh town or whatever. It'd be a big thing coming to Manchester, wouldn't it? So that yeah. in itself would would have been huge. You know, no parents, anything like that around. Obviously, he'd been in digs up in Manchester. It's it's a lot. So that's the one thing that I would say about football these days. To your point, Dan, is that they do look after the kids. I think a lot better than what they used to. And mm. just being, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, downgrading my era of football because or, or coaching because um, there's a lot more money around now, so it, which enables us maybe to help, help players a little bit more, you know, through the what we call the social and emotional side of things. Um, but uh, again, that it, it, those days. Um, it's basically, you know what, you, you, you're in the firing squad now, son, and everybody got treated the same, and it was, it was, it was a, it was kill or be killed. You know what I mean? It was that kind of yeah. environment. It was. Tom, uh, yeah, it's quite brutal, really, isn't it? When you think about mm. it, 
And you can, you can see why there's such a low percentage of P2 lads that actually do make it through to, to, to first team regular, but works two ways, doesn't it? It's too much pressure from the coaching and the management side. So it's such a fine fine art to try and manage a group of lads and group of girls and their personalities to get the best out of them when everyone's so individual and so different. It must be really hard as a coach these days to be able to do that. I mean, back, back then, like you said, I bet you were treated with a stick and lock an awful lot of times. So, and now it's a case of you, everyone's got to try and manage different personalities with in different age groups, etc. So it must be quite hard. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it, it's easy, but I just think, you know, it, it, again, it's... And particularly when you become parents, you, you become different people, don't you? Do you know what I mean? So you kind of start thinking, well, would I want my kid to be spoken to like that? Would I, I, I would speak to anybody else's kid like that. Do you know what I mean? So even through my coaching career, I've always been conscious about how I speak to people, how I speak to kids. Mm. I'll speak to kids, I'll speak to young people. I will speak to players as in adults, because even as adults, you still want respect. Of course you, you, still want, you still want to say, all right, well done, when you've done well. Um, and if I need to tell you something, I'm going to tell you. But afterwards, you know, it's nothing personal. It's just, you know, we're in an environment where you win a game of football, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. So, um, and that's it. So where's, that's where's, it. where's the where's the, um, the, the coaching world going to take you? Can you ever see the management side in Canada? Is, is that ever in the inkling? Or are you happy with what you're doing for now and that, you, that, that part of you's done now? It's it's funny, um, Tom, that you say that. Um, I'd have liked to have got some opportunities earlier. Um, and, I, and again, it's pretty, maybe I don't know whether people have spoken about this on your show much and stuff, but it was about opportunities. Mm. And, um, and and I know that, you know, coaching, you know, I coached at Mosley and, and, you know, and did a decent job at Mosley and, you know, probably should have gone on and, got, and co coached somewhere else as well. And maybe I, I didn't put myself forward enough, maybe. Um, I mean, a professional, but it's about having opportunities. So um, I'd, I'd have liked the opportunity earlier. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure about being here. Football's different here in Canada. You know, they, they, no disrespect, but they're more about, you know, registrations and, uh, you know, and uh, being the, the business side of things as opposed to developing players. So I'm not sure I really want to do it, but you know, if, it, if an opportunity came or you know, about coaching at home and stuff like that, now my kids are kind of grown up and stuff, you know, you know, this, this, I'd never say never, uh, but I'm quite happy doing what I do where I, I am, um, I'm a coach educator here, so for Ontario soccer, so I deliver, you know, their coaching license courses here. Um, but also as well, I, I, I work for myself where there are, co um, Lots of clubs here that uh, need coach, coaching mentorships, uh, mentorship. So I help them through their their coaching process and write, you know, play development curriculums and stuff like that for the for the clubs because the the knowledge here isn't isn't the same as it is back home. So I've been able to you know carve out a little niche for myself where uh, um, you know I, I'll I can work for these clubs on a consultancy basis. I'm gonna say you tapped yourself into cracking little market there haven't you to, to market yourself and, and what you do and it sounds like you're doing quite well which is good yeah I'm, do, I'm, I'm doing all right i keep the wolf from the door as a, as a place say, as a saying goes but uh you know obviously we're living in challenging times aren't we in the moment and, yeah yeah and it's been really tough on it for everybody been, been able to do much over over the likes of zoom or skype or have yeah you kind of battened out the actions for a couple yeah of i mean been, everyone's become a pro at this now aren't they this, this zoom yeah. thing flipping it been be giving out caps for zoom soon <laughs> but um but uh yeah so yeah i've been doing that and we're starting to get on the field now as you know as you know we're probably getting into we've gone into yeah. different phases now i mean we're probably one of those countries that um you know I, you know we've not done bad with the with the virus you know i think that you know we've the, the uh, provincial government and the, the federal government they've, they've dealt with it pretty well and the message, the message has been pretty consistent so as a country you know Canada has done pretty well with the virus um, but the, that other place a bit further south that to us like I mean they're having a nightmare but, um, sounds like it doesn't it yeah, yeah. They're having a nightmare but Again, we're we're out on the field now, so that that's a that's a good good start. A good yeah, one. I know the FA released uh, the grassroots in the other was it last week, a week before, saying that they can start. Yeah, I think it was, right? yeah, a few yeah a few weeks ago now. Yeah, they put something you know, like a blueprint out there, so yeah, they, they did pretty well with that. Brilliant. Well, listen, uh, Jason, I, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, Dan. Have you got anything else to add, pal? 
Yeah, I've got a, one last Go on, question, buddy. and it's going back a bit. Like I say, I uh, probably should have interrupted you earlier, but you just want to roll, Jason, so I'll just let you go here. But yeah. Obviously, uh, you finished your career, like you said, you probably should have finished at 22. And obviously, your mates were poor late, and we've had Lakey on show, and uh, he was mm. saying about they, they just were no idea about treatment. Ugh. And so I just wondered if you, if it's exact same with you, I just wondered... What yeah. do you make of it now? Like, question. Yeah, well, I mean, like I say, uh, it, it, you know what sp professional sports like anyway, it's about, um, there's a bit of luck in terms of injuries, isn't there? Mm. So, you know, you want to be injury free, but again, the, the treatment and the rehab is of paramount importance and Lake will probably tell you, it's like, a, he, he probably told you the story, we, had, we used to have one surgeon at, at, at City at the time and he probably told you the fella's name, he was a fella called Dr. Markham and that that fellow, he, he he operated on. I think he probably operated on. Um, I think he operated on Lakey twice. Um, he had his medial ligaments and really should have tightened up his his um his ACL there. But what I'm saying is the the people that they that they had, they just weren't they weren't competent. A lot of those surgeons were were operating on no disrespect, but you know you your normal you know fella woman on the street who weren't sports people where mm. we, we obviously put in our bodies through different rigors different you know stresses and we needed it you know we needed proper sports um sports scientists and, and sports um surgeons and we didn't get that so Lakey got you know like I say he, he started on his journey up from that fellow Dr. Mark I had a fellow called Mr. Hurst that the same for he actually operated on my mother he operated on my mother, mm. you, know, you know, with with Ernie, and um, he he said he trimmed up my knee when I was about nineteen at City. He, when um, when I say trim, he trimmed in the meniscus. He'd actually taken most of it out. So when I went to Birmingham, uh, I, I just as it, as it happens all the time, an innocuous challenge, and all of a sudden my knees like a thin, a mess. So all through, you know, the the kind of care that. Um, that, that we got back in those days in, um, in the 80s and the, in the early 90s. Having said that, you know, that, that's the one thing that they are getting now, which is more power to them, um, is qualified people. I mean, we, we, we never even had a qualified physiotherapist at City. I mean, can you believe that? The amount of players yeah. that came at City, they, they, our physiotherapist wasn't even qualified. You know, he's dealing with all of those, play, all those players there. He, you know, it's a joke, really. Uh, I know Lakey would have probably said Lakey would have probably been a bit more diplomatic than me, but like uh, <laughs> the, the way that the way that he that. is. But, but all right, okay, <laughs> nice one. Okay, I'll give you that one. All right, I'll I'll say okay. What do you say? So uh, I, think, I think yeah, it's very. I think it's very financially driven. I think you're on those one one hundred percent. And like I say, they did they kind of like cut a lot of corners because all of a sudden it would have it would have cost them more to to do it properly. Really, in the end, it actually would have probably would have. Might have been cheaper, might it? But there you go. In the in the yeah. long run, it's, it's a different, like I say, a different world between twenty years ago and now, and thirty years ago and now, etc. It's it's it makes me think about how it's going to advance in years to come. Because you look at City's medical arena, the the, the oh, almost the hospital they've got, the, the academies, they've kind of got cryogenic chilling chambers <laughs> and yeah, like walking pools, walking your know, running pools you know, underneath the water while you're doing it. It's bonkers, really, compared to. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Tom, but, but let's be honest, though, Tom, I think, I think it's right, though. I mean, you're talking about the, 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 they're athletes, aren't they, and that are, that are highly tuned, you know, physical specimens, if you like, athletes that are, that have been asked to do certain things that, like I can say, no respect to anybody, that your, your normal man in the street aren't being asked to do. So they're, they're being given every opportunity to, to make sure they can go and perform at the highest level, so... And, and the, the the money that's there, and the the, the money that's there, and the, the things that's at stake, it's it, it's fair, isn't it? So, I always say, fill your boots as much as it, you know with these kids. You know, fill your boots. Hope it all happens for you. If it, at least, um, as I say, I mean, you talk about people being first team players, you know, regularly. I mean, even just being a professional, the, you know, the the actual the, the percentage is, is very very low. It's point whatever it is. Yeah, so um, it's it's ridiculous. So. The, the, these clubs are, you know, doing doing the right thing by the clubs. I got to give. I go. I always take me out off to the the owner at Man City. 
because you know what, he's not just he's coming, he's invested a lot of money in this in the in in the in the club, not just on the field but off the field as well. So fair play to him and good luck to him. Listen, Dan, listen, Jason, it's been an absolute delight to talk to you, pal. Thank you so much for doing us. Dan, I'm assuming you've got nothing else to add, pal. What, what's for tea, Dan? Uh, no, it's uh, <laughs> going from way, looking like a red elephant. Bag of <laughs> Dan, I could kill, I could kill a flipping Scott Jag. You can't I get out round here. Scott Jag, a, 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 a squat, Scott Jag, or a, a sausage roll or something. You can't get out like that round here. Flipping heck. Can you mark <laughs> right, it there for you, Jason? Yeah, yeah. The, the only thing I'm going to say, Jason, Probably. if you want to ever come on again, and uh, if we ever took, because we, we have a sore subject of the Academy and the Manchester is Blue show, so if you ever fancy coming on again and giving us your views on that, we'd appreciate it. Very much. Well, so. listen, I, I, I probably know what you're going to say and everything, but. I'd I'd love to talk about that because that that's a that's another subject that's that's kind of close to my heart because I'm kind of thinking all right we we can't play football in Manchester anymore what's going on do you know what I mean? But, <laughs> yeah, I, I, bad, I, right. yeah, I don't know about Snowden lads, all right. Yeah, it's <laughs> not bad, deal, is it? <laughs> yeah, not bad. Well, Stockport, isn't he? Stockport, country, country isn't he? He's, a, he's he's a bit posh, isn't he? Posh <laughs> Manchester. Oh, oh brilliant. <laughs> Right, right, we'll get you on again, Jason. Thanks very much. Nice one. Really All the best, Tom. Nice one, lads. Cheers, lads. Have a good night. Cheers, mate. Try, right. Try.